But I'm encouraged for the word of God says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God, we know you have all power. And God, you know to the intent of what this message needs to do tonight. So Father, I pray you'd hedge us in. We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus over this place. We pray for the glorious light of the gospel and the truth of the scriptures to shine brightly tonight. We pray for your people. Lord, we will discuss things that folks don't like to talk about. But Lord, sometimes we just have to face things so we can uh, certainly get victory over them. So Father, help your people tonight. Send revival. I know there's some watching tonight. Help them. And God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. And amen. Uh, here Paul is uh, concluding the epistle that he was inspired to write to the church at Ephesus and more particularly to the young pastor there, Timothy. And he draws our attention to uh, several things in these verses. The first thing he draws our attention to is our will. Look at verse number 10 again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let me just say this right now, that there is nobody in this building from the man standing behind the pulpit uh, to the ones in the sound room uh, and everybody in between, there's nobody here tonight that is a match for the devil. Uh, the devil has power tonight. Uh, the devil's slick, he's crafty, uh, and in our own abilities, we're no match for him. Uh, so the best thing that you can ever learn to do is submit your will to the will of God. Uh, not to stand in your strength, but to stand in the strength of our Lord. Uh, uh, we find that even the writer of Jude, or the, the epistle Jude, Jude tells us that Michael uh, didn't even uh, uh, cast accusation against the devil, uh, but he did it in the name of the Lord. Uh, and uh, you and I have to learn that uh, uh, the Lord's well able to handle the devil, uh, and we just hang out with the Lord and it'll be all right. Uh, but we need to uh, stay strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Uh, let me just say this before I move on. There are two types of people the devil always preys on. He always preys on those that are weak-minded or weak in the faith. He never goes after the strongest sheep. He gets the weakest one. And so the best way you can ever combat spiritual warfare is to build yourself up on your most holy faith, walk with the Lord, uh, hang out with the Lord, uh, and you'll, you'll find the devil won't mess with you like he does those that are weaker. Mm, matter of fact, if you're walking with the Lord, the devil don't want to come anywhere near you. Because then he's got to deal with the Lord. Mm. So we see that Paul tries to draw attention to our will. It's a dangerous thing when you think you can handle it. It is a dangerous thing when you think you have arrived. It is a dangerous thing when you uh, uh, have learned enough of the Scripture and you have walked enough with the Lord where you think you're equipped. Peter did. And the Lord told him that Satan had desired to sift him as wheat. And the Lord said, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And can I say, if Peter, who literally walked with the Lord, couldn't handle it, neither could you or I. So learn to submit your will to the will of God. If you stay in the lap of Jesus, you'll be all right. Uh, he also draws our attention uh, to the wiles of the devil. Verse 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And by the way, verses 12 through 17, or uh, verses yeah, uh, 13 through 17 will explain the whole armor of God. But he said, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil has snares and traps and fiery darts and all kinds of things that he uh, lays before us and shoots at us and tries to do everything in his power to get us off track. But when you put on the whole armor of God and when you walk with the Lord and you're strong in the Lord and you walk in the power of the Lord's might, 
you're able to withstand the wiles of the devil. But my dear friends, when you take your eyes off of Jesus, just like when Peter walked on the water, he did good until he got to looking around. And then he began to sink. Uh, can I say the devil's tactics are not new? He's using the same tactics he did with Eve. He tries to get you to question the Word of God. And then he tries to get you to make decisions void of the Word of God. And any time you do that, you're going to get in trouble. Hmm? There's been a lot of people made shipwreck of their life because they just took their eyes off the things of God for a second. So he brings our attention to our will. He brings our attention to the wiles of the devil, but he also brings our attention to wrestling. This is Chloe Best's verse right here. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. People are not your enemy. Now somebody full of the devil may cause you a lot of conflict, but keep in mind it's the spirit within them, not them. Hmm? But you will wrestle against things that are out of your control, and that are bigger than you. Let me just give you this. This isn't in the message, but it just came to mind. I've often said this in my Sunday school class. The Lord taught His disciples through parables. A parable is an earthly story with a hidden heavenly truth. And every day of your life is a parable. In every situation you find yourself, there's a parable. The Lord's trying to teach you something. At the end of your day, you ought to sit down and say, Lord, what did you try and teach me today? Maybe you had a conflict with a coworker. Lord, what was you trying to teach me out of that conflict today? Maybe uh, 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 you had a situation on the highway where somebody uh, had a little road rage. Lord, what was you trying to teach me that? Maybe you had to uh, uh, meet with a doctor and they think something's going on with your thyroid. Maybe you need to sit down and say, Now, Lord, what was you trying to teach me in this situation? And the truth of the matter is, we don't talk to the Lord like that, and we don't examine our lives like that, and we don't sit down and ask the Lord, what is He trying to teach us? But we'd be much farther down the road if we did. Hmm? We wrestle against things that we don't understand. And by the way, I'm not one of these woolly booger kind of guys. You know, I'm not a guy that signs up to go to you know, exercise a demon out of somebody. Mm, that's woolly booger stuff to me. Uh, uh, I'll let somebody else handle that deal. But listen, there are people possessed with the devil. There is a lot of demon activity in our world right now. Mm. Um, by the way, there's demon activity in some of our politicians. There's demon activity in some of our local elected officials. There's demon activity in our school systems. There are demon activity even in churches. The devil is influencing people, and they're biting it and taking it hook, line, and sinker. Hmm? When you walk in the light as the Lord's in the light, you can recognize this stuff. But if you bury your head in the sand like an ostrich, you don't see all that's going on. There's a lot of spiritual darkness going on in this world. Do hmm? you know why there's such an epidemic with drugs? Demon activity. People can't live with their lives. Hmm? There are so many influences in people's lives today, and they are all born out of the heart of Satan. And his sole purpose is to drag people's souls up into hell. And he'll do whatever he can to accomplish it. You and I are the ones to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. We're the ones to shine the light. We're the ones to be the salt of the earth, and we're the ones to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ so people don't have to die and go to hell. But if we ourselves don't have victory, 
How in the world can we show somebody else how to have victory? Now listen, Paul makes it abundantly clear that we have an enemy. And we're in a battle. We have an enemy. The devil hates you. Hates everything about you. Hates everything you stand for. He hates the Bible. He hates church. He hates that hymn book. He hates that you come to church. He hates everything there is about you. Now, if you've been here any length of time, I, I've told you why he hates you. Because you can become what he never could. He wanted to uh, uh, exalt himself above the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he was kicked out of heaven. Uh, uh, he was uh, the anointed cherub. He, he was uh, uh, created more beautiful than any other, other angel. And he was the music minister of heaven. Uh, but yet he wanted in his pride to become the Lord. And he was kicked out. So the Lord said, I'll show you. I'm going to make a mud pie, breathe in it, make it alive. They're never going to see me, never hear my audible voice. But if by faith they'll believe on my son, I'm going to make them a son of God, what you never could be. That's why he hates man. Because we can become what he couldn't in the person of Jesus Christ. You have an enemy. He hates you. Hmm? Listen, some of these goofy politicians trying to uh, uh, send money over there to calm down the Middle East, those people over there know one thing, warfare. They are a violent people. Matter of fact, the Bible calls them lion-like men. They know one thing, violence. The only way that you will ever tame that crowd is through violence. Hmm? Teddy Roosevelt had a good uh, system back uh, uh, at the turn of the century. There were some Muslims in upstate New York that was causing a ruckus, uh, uh, and they killed some people, so uh, uh, they were put to death, and Teddy Roosevelt had them buried in hog carcasses. Because under their religion, they can't go to their heaven. I feel sorry for the hogs. You say, what did that do? That kept terrorist activity out of America for almost 100 years. But now, we can't offend anybody. Huh? That's why it's a good thing I'm not president. I just fly over that crowd over there and just shoot lard all over them. We have an enemy. Paul makes it abundantly clear that we're engaged in a warfare. Why do you think he told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Hmm? We're in a warfare. Now I understand that most people just think life is busy and everything goes on and, and it's all you can do to get into church and you come to church on Wednesday or you come to church on Sunday and boy, I need some help to get through life. What you don't realize is all the stress and all the pressure and everything you're facing is because you're in a warfare. The devil is trying to keep you so busy and so your, your life's spinning like a top that you don't focus on really what you're here to do. And that's to tell others about Jesus. That's to live a life that shows others how good Jesus is. We're in a warfare. We have an enemy. We're engaged in warfare. And he makes it abundantly clear that we have an enigma. What is the enigma? Well, the enigma is we cannot see our enemy. We don't know if he's in the shadows or not. Now, I can take refuge in the fact that the devil's not omnipresent. Jesus is. The devil's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Jesus does. The devil's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Jesus is. But he does have a bunch of imps. By the way, I've cautioned people, you better be very careful letting other people know what affects you. Because the devil might be listening. Have you ever, uh, you know, Googled pair of shoes? And then every engine search after that, pairs of shoes pop up. The devil's the same way. If he hears you tell somebody, hey, pray for me, I'm really struggling in this area of my life, what do you think he's going to hit you with? He's not omniscient, but he is listening. Hmm? Can I say this? 
We've got an enigma. We cannot see our enemy. We have an enigma. We cannot physically engage in the warfare. There are times I'd like to grab Slewfoot by the horns and smack him, but the truth of the matter is he don't have horns. He don't have a pitchfork. He don't have a red suit. The Bible said he can be transformed into an angel of light. Hmm. I personally think he can be transformed into, you know, a Corvette. Because they affect me every time I see one. Uh, no, but it's amazing how he knew Delilah was the one that could get Samson. Hmm? It's amazing he knew Bathsheba could get David. Hmm? It's amazing he knew just a little cup of porridge would cause Esau to sell his birthright. Our enigma is we got an enemy who knows how to affect us, but we can't put our hands on him. Can I say this? The enigma also is that we cannot enter the battlefield, yet it's all around us. I mean, one thing we say, okay, we're going to meet at the schoolyard after school, and we're going to settle this thing. But every time you take a step, you're actually in the battlefield. You could be sitting in your recliner at home with the lights off all by yourself and you're in the battlefield. Hmm. This is what I want to preach on tonight. I want to preach on this thought. I want to preach on the demons within. The demons within. Now, please hear me right now. People that have been saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, sealed by the Holy Ghost of God, cannot be indwelled by a demon. You cannot be possessed by a demon. A demon cannot have any influence over you internally. You can't. Now, folks that aren't saved, they can be possessed by a demon. As a matter of fact, demons seek to possess a body because that's how they can influence this world the most. You cannot convince me that a lot of the shootings that we see, a lot of uh, the horror that goes on in the world, is it because somebody who did it was possessed. A lot of these school shootings, these kids, they're involved in a lot of dark things on the Internet. They're getting possessed by demons, and the demons tell them, go shoot up their classmates, and they do it. Hmm. Of course, you talk like that, and the world thinks you're crazy. The world don't believe in demons because they're being run by demons. A saved, spirit-filled person cannot be possessed by a demon. But in the act of spiritual warfare, the devil can interject thoughts in your mind which, uh, left unchecked, can haunt you, can affect you spiritually, and can manipulate your actions. You may not have a demon within you, but there are things that the devil has injected in your mind because that's where the battle is. He can't get your soul. Your soul sealed by the Holy Ghost. But he can put thoughts in your mind and he can interject things in your mind that if you let them lodge there long enough, they will become demonized thoughts. And those demons go with you everywhere you go. Hmm? Those that were addicted to things and God has helped them to overcome their addiction they will tell you they are always an addict and there are demons that haunt them that still want them to partake in that thing every day they have to deal with it hmm? and my dear friends there are demons that Christians deal with every day internally things that haunt them Things that will cause them to blow their testimony if they're not careful. So what are these thoughts or quote-unquote demons that folks deal with? Uh, let me just help you with this. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, or 23, 7, uh, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If the devil can get you to think about something, Brother Bob, long enough, It'll take root and it'll lodge in your heart. And then you'll act on it and then it becomes sin. Having the thought isn't sin. It's when you act on it. 
And if you, uh, the devil tells you you're a loser long enough and you start believing it, then nothing I can say can help you because you believe you're a loser. Hmm? On the contrary, if you're out of the will of God and the devil convinces you you're in the will of God, there's nothing I can say to help you there. The Holy Ghost don't turn on the light in your soul. You'll think you're in the will of God and you're living like the devil himself. We preach all the time. Folks sitting here, and, and the Word of God ought to convict them. And they sit there and it bounces off of them like a rubber ball because they've convinced themselves they're okay. So what are these demons that people deal with? What can I say? There's the, the thought or the demon of indecision. The Bible makes it clear we're to know the will of God. The Bible makes it clear we're to walk in light of the Scriptures. The Bible makes it clear that we're to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. And yet, there are people, they're like yo-yos. They're flipping, flopping, and everything. They're like Bill Clinton. They flip and flop on everything. They're indecisive. That is never the will of God. We're to know what thus saith the Lord. But there are people who are indecisive. They doubt everything. They doubt whether they're saved. They doubt whether they're in the will of God. They doubt whether uh, uh, Jesus loves them. They doubt whether they never have victory. Uh, they doubt the Scriptures. They can read the Scriptures. Well, does that really mean that, or does it mean something else? And they're all the time indecisive. Listen, I'd have more hair if I didn't pastor people who could make a decision. Hmm. I bet in the last 25 years I've dealt with this topic as much as any other topic, people being indecisive. I can't make up their minds for them, Brother Jim. The Word of God will, but when their mind is so filled with doubt, they'll even doubt the Scriptures. You know what the Bible says? Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth, is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There are some who, that demon of indecision rules their life. Hmm. They just don't know how to, how to respond. Well, is God speaking to me? Should I testify tonight or should I not testify? I don't know if God's speaking to me or not. Should I sing tonight or should I not sing tonight? I don't know if, if it's God speaking to me or not. Should I go to the altar or should I stay here? Am I going to interrupt the service? I just don't know. And they're constantly indecisive. You know what? Uh, I, I, I kind of live by this rule. If there's doubt, don't. Because God makes His way clear. Hmm? He might only let you know one step at a time, but He makes His way clear. So if you're doubting whether or not it's God, it probably isn't. Hmm? But there is that demon of indecision, and people are constantly in a spiritual turmoil because they just don't know the will of God. How in the world, Miss Lisa, can I help somebody else to know the will of God if I don't know the will of God for my life? Hmm? How can I emphatically tell people Jesus is the way if deep down in my heart I'm doubting whether or not I even know the way? Hmm? -mm. It's a great tool, the devil. Mm -mm. Again, we are to walk by faith. And our faith can't be based on emotion, but on fact. What is the fact? The Scriptures. God said it, that settles it. I'm just going to go with God. But if I'm not taking a steady appetite of the Scriptures, and if I'm not walking in light of the Scriptures, guess what? I'm in turmoil. Mm -hmm. I've got a GPS, but it's not telling me the right way. Mm, there's the thought within, or the demon within of indecision. There's also the thought, or the demon within, of indiscretion. Will anybody be honest here tonight and say, since you got saved, you've sinned? Hallelujah. 100% participation. What a blessing. Because if you didn't raise your hand, I was going to call you liar, liar, pants on fire right now. 
Listen, we've all failed the grace of God. And it don't matter if you categorize it as a little sin or a big sin, because in the eyes of God, it's sin. He can't accept any of it. And it took the precious blood of Christ to forgive and cleanse us from all sin. So we can all be in agreement in this flesh we have not reached sinless perfection. Uh, the problem is, is there some, Brother James, who have failed God. They've asked God to forgive them. In accordance to 1 John 1, 9, if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we'll confess it, say, God, I'm sorry, I blew it, please forgive me. In accordance to the Bible, He will. But then they wonder if he really forgave them. Because they still feel guilty. Because I shouldn't have done that. And so I drag it with me everywhere I go. Come here. You're my failure. <laughs> everywhere I go. I've done ask Jesus to forgive me of it. But she's still with me. You're a good burden. <laughs> and you know what? The devil lets you carry her everywhere you go. Thank you. To be honest with you, I should have got somebody much bigger. Because a lot of times, we're dragging it. And Jesus has forgiven us but you won't forgive yourself and that thing weighs on you and that thing eats you and that thing robs you of the victory you have in Christ because he's forgiven you and you'll over and over and over bring that to God trying to get forgiveness and you don't even know what you're talking about because once he forgives it it's gone he doesn't remember it anymore but see, you're dealing with it. The devil's needling with it, needling you with it, because he knows that's that he's got your goat there. And everywhere you go, you've got that with you. And you have no victory. You have no joy. You're grieving the Holy Ghost, asking Him to forgive something He's already forgiven. And you're constantly, constantly, constantly dealing with that indiscretion. You get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, all you see is that. Mm -mm. And throughout the day, you start enjoying yourself, then you feel guilty you're enjoying yourself. You sit in church, and all you can think about is when you blew it. And it just constantly eats at you. It's a demon within. Now listen to the Scriptures. Romans chapter 8 says this, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. If you've asked Him to forgive you of it, it's gone. So now walk in the Spirit. Walk in the light of God's forgiveness and God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. You know, you don't deserve it, but you've got it anyway goes on to say, For uh, uh, the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and debt. You see, under the law, you had to carry her everywhere you went with you. You didn't get any relief or any freedom from it. But in grace, He broke the chains of that bondage. And you're free in Christ. He's made us free from that. It goes on to say this, uh, 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 in verse 3, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are uh, after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, 
But to be spiritually minded is life and peace uh, because the carnal mind is in enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? When you got saved, you became a spiritual being to God. You became alive to God. And what Christ did on the cross and what Christ did when He forgave you is He destroyed that condemnation. My dear friends, when we ask Him to forgive us and then drag it around with us, we are telling Him His work is not good enough in our lives. And that's why you have no victory. That's why you have no joy. You say, well, why would God forgive me? I don't know. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve His forgiveness. I don't deserve His love. I don't deserve His mercy. I don't deserve any of those things. Uh, uh, but one thing I do know, the Bible says that He loved us with an everlasting love. Uh, uh, the Bible says that uh, uh, His grace uh, has been imputed unto us. Uh, the Bible says we're justified by faith. Uh, and my dear friends, uh, I don't know why He did, but He did, and blessed be His name that we can walk in forgiveness. Now here is why you can't forget sin when you get forgiveness of it. So that you won't ever do it again. It is a buffer or a reminder of how horrible it felt to disgrace the Lord. And how privileged it is to know the Lord that He would forgive us. So you don't ever disappoint Him again. Somebody that really gets forgiveness, they don't want to disappoint God again. So, the demon of indiscretion, it haunts a lot of people. A lot of people deal with their past. That's why you got to learn look unto Jesus the author and finish your faith and look toward the future there's nothing back there that can help you be thankful for the day he's blessed you with walk in light of forgiveness and when the devil wants to bring up that indiscretion shout the victory say hallelujah it's under the blood hmm there is the demon of indecision, the demon of indiscretion. But I, th I find another one. There is the demon of insecurity. There are so many people walking around insecure. Brother Rod, I tend to think a lot of it's because of how they were raised. They're insecure. They're insecure about their looks. They're insecure about their makeup. They're just insecure. The beauty of being saved is we become new creatures in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And part of the gifts of the Spirit is to build in us an esteem towards God. Not prideful things, but what we are in Christ. A peculiar people. A royal priesthood. A chosen generation. And when you get in the Bible and you start seeing what you have in Christ, that ought to build up some esteem. But there are so many people that are insecure. They're so insecure. Well, I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't. I, I just don't know about this. And I don't know about this. I don't. I, I'm a terrible Christian. I'm a sorry. And the reality is, you need to get over yourself. You need to get a hold of that verse. Not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Yeah, Paul said, "In me, in my flesh, dwell no good thing." But hallelujah for that inward man. 
that took up resident when I got born again. Hmm? But there are so many people that are insecure about their Christian life and insecure about their prayer life and in, insecure about their walk with the Lord and insecure about, you know, do I have eternal life and insecure about so many things. John wrote this in 1 John 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Hmm? You ought to know if you're saved or not because you've got a witness in yourself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life uh, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If, if you just get in the Scriptures and believe the Scriptures, it'll help your insecure problem. Hmm? I don't know everything about the Bible, but what I do know, I know. And you're not going to get me to back up on any of it. God's proven it to me. Uh, but there's so many people just insecure. God help you. What do you got to be insecure about in Christ? He loves you just like you are. He formed you, made you, he loves you. You don't have to meet a certain mold or certain temperature or certain whatever. He loves you. And he gave his life for you. And he's going to prepare a place for you. And he's promised you to never leave you nor forsake you. Be a friend that's sticking close to a brother. What's to be insecure about? Insecurity affects a lot of people. Hmm. Well, Brother Doug, I'm just not the Christian. I should be. Well, be it. Start being a Christian, you should be. You're just holding on to an excuse. I like what Brother Greg Phillips says. Excuse is just words wrapped around lies. Mm -mm. Know what you want. Somebody feels sorry for you. No. I'm not feeling sorry for you. If you're saved, I ought to be happy for you. I thought of another one. I've got to hurry. I've spent too much time on this. There is the thought or the demon of insufficiency. I'm not good enough. Again, Brother Jim, that probably stems from the way people were raised. They had parents that told them they were losers. You're not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. Had teachers tell them you're never going to be good enough. Going to have... You know what Jesus said? He said that he was good enough. And that you're in him and he's in you. Uh, but I'm just not sufficient. But he is. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. First John 3 says this, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love hath uh, the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath his hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. All of these demons affect you when you are looking at you. But when you're looking at him, they lose all their hold on you. The real key is how you look. Half full or half empty. There is the demon or the thought of independence. This is a dangerous one. There are those that really believe they can do this thing without Christ. I can do it my way. Hmm? Pride and selfishness will propel them to live their Christian life how they want to. That is dangerous. Hmm? Well, Brother Doug, I know what the Bible says, but I'm just going to live this way. That is dangerous, friend. Uh, John 15, 4 says this, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you are saved, you belong to Him. You do not make the decisions for your life anymore. The Bible and the Lord does. You belong. He bought you with a price. He paid for your sin. Yes, He's preparing you a place in heaven, but you belong to Him. Now, your responsibility is to live a life that glorifies Him. And when you don't, you're going to answer to Him. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that uh, if we're sin, you know, if we're without chastisement, we're a bastard, not a son. The Lord knows how to chasten His. Hmm? Paul said, for this cause many are sick among, among you, and uh, some even sleep. In other words, God puts some in the graveyard. It's a dangerous thing to play with the things of God. And that spirit of independence comes from the devil himself the philosophy of Satan is my right to my claim to myself and every Sunday there will be people come in and they'll sit in this sanctuary and they'll hear the word of God preach and they'll walk out to their car and they'll say well I'm going to do however I want to do that's dangerous one of two things here they don't know the Lord or number two they don't respect the Lord it's a dangerous dangerous thing that spirit of independence you can do what you want to if it feels good do it that's the philosophy of the devil my dear friends, it haunts people. Hmm? Recently heard that somebody said the preacher was picking on them from the pulpit. Well, I wasn't, but if I made them mad, I'd rather make them mad than make them comfortable. Hmm? Uh, i got a preacher friend of mine says, if I don't make somebody mad every now and then, I need to do some checking up. I don't try to make you mad. I try to get you right with God. But I don't use that pulpit uh, as, a, as a whipping post for somebody sitting in the congregation. But if the Word of God whips you while you're sitting in the congregation, that's why we have an altar call so you can get right with the Lord. Hmm? Huh? I know when I was sitting out there before I was pastoring, if the preacher didn't get on my toes every now and then, something's wrong. Hmm? Huh? Sometimes he'd jump on them. Hmm? Say, what'd you do? I'd try and get right with God, and then I'd go hug his neck and thank him for preaching to me that way. None of you like me. I'm hard-headed. Hmm? Sometimes, you know, I need to be skinned real good. That's why I like preaching. I like it when a man of God will stand open this Bible and say, Thus saith the Lord. Hmm? But that spirit of indifference or that spirit of independence causes people to live out of the will of God. A lot of people out of church thinking they're okay. The last thing, I'll be done. There's a spirit of indifference. Can I just say this? There's one program here. It's the Lord's program. It's not Brother Doug's. It's not anybody else's. It's the Lord's program around here. Can I say this? There's one click around here. It's the Lord's click. I highly recommend being in it. Get born again and get in it. Mm. Uh, the Lord's click's always got arms wide open. Everybody's welcome. Hmm? Well, those that think there's a click and those that think there's an agenda they're not right with God hmm? uh, but there are from time to time folks that show up with a spirit of indifference they want to go against the grain of what the Lord's doing Jesus called them wolves in sheep's clothing but there are some that have a spirit of indifference about them. Uh, let me give you what the Bible says about this spirit of indifference. You find it in Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. 
a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and here it is, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. And can I say, God hates those that sow discord among the brethren, that have a spirit of indifference, that want to go against what God says, go against what God has set forth, a spirit of indifference. They're going to do it their way. And that demon haunts people. I've used the crude analogy. You know, any time that, you know, we say, well, we're going to enter a building program. And somebody goes, but preacher, that'll cost a lot of money. Well, we're going to do this to help a family. But preacher, that costs a lot of money. Well, we're going to put Ray to work and build something else out back. But preacher, sheep follow goats but. That spirit of indifference, always butting against what God's are doing. Hmm? Uh, I just like being somewhere where God's are doing something. Listen, Psalms 133 one says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Isn't it wonderful to be a, in a church where everybody loves one another and gets along? It's, it's, it's wonderful. Hey, I can remember back about 15 years ago, we had some people that had a spirit of indifference. Huh? That isn't no fun. Uh, somebody always causing something behind the scenes. Um, they got a problem. I guess they sit up late at night trying to figure out how they can cause problems in the church. Huh? Well, I wouldn't want to meet God that way, would you? Huh? Uh, I want to have that spirit of unity, that spirit of, yes, Lord, whatever. Um, when I surrendered to preach, my grandfather had already, already had a stroke. And he fell and then broke his back and he knew his time for pastoring was about over. As a matter of fact, he even told the church, start candidating, and when God sent the man, he'd gladly step down. When I surrendered to preach. He counseled me, and he told me this, to get on the coattail of a good pastor. He said, keep your mouth shut. He knew me. And whatever he says, you do it. He said, you'll learn more from that preacher than you'll ever learn at Bible college. And the Lord led me over to Brother Pittman. And uh, I was happy to serve under Brother Pittman. learned a lot from Brother Pittman. Brother Pittman would take me places, introduce me to preachers, and help get me started. But I'll never forget. Hadn't been there long. And Brother Pittman had one of them spirit of indifferent guys in the church. I didn't know much, know much about it. But evidently, every time Brother Pittman wanted to do something, this guy would balk at him. Well, then here I show up. And Brother Pittman come in, and one, one for service, we're talking. He said, he said, the Lord kind of laid it on my heart. We need to do this. He said, what do you think? I remember what my grandpa told me. I said, preacher, if God said do it, it don't matter what I think. Let's do it. And that seemed to kind of give... Brother Pittman, I guess, a little extra courage or something. So he said, we're going to do it. And after that, he didn't care what that spirit of indifferent guy said. Brother Pittman, the Lord said it. We did it. Well, that's the way we ought to be. Huh? Say, what happened? Well, that guy didn't last long. But God blessed abundantly in the church. See, that guy was a P&G employee. Big money guy in the church. Those guys always think that they get to get to run the church, you know. And and one of the deacons come to Brother Pittman and said, you know, if you make him mad and he leaves, it's really going to affect the finance. He said, I don't care how much money he gives. Huh? Say, so what happened? He left. And God sent in about eight families in a matter of no time. And God started blessing and folks started getting saved. And God moved in. And you see, you can't beat unity. 
indifference quenches and grieves the Holy Ghost. And when somebody's got that spirit of indifference, you can't help them. Only God can do something with them. Now listen, we've, we've talked about these things. There's other things that haunt people. The only way that you can combat spiritual warfare is in three avenues. Number one, with the Scriptures. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, three times the devil threw something at him, lust of the eyes, lust of the pride of life, and lust of the flesh. The Lord defeated him each time with, it is written. The Scriptures will help you with any thought or spirit or demon that haunts you. The Scriptures will help you. Say, I don't know where to turn. Well, just part your Bible in the middle and go to Psalms and start reading the Psalms. It'll uplift you, if nothing else. But you'll be amazed at how that, that demonic influence flees when you're focused on the Scriptures. Can I say, secondly, supplication, praying. The devil will fight you the hardest when you make time to pray. He knows that when you're on your knees before God, that moves heaven towards earth. He'll fight prayer more than anything else because that's where the power comes from for the child of God. Now, I caution you to be careful when you pray to God and you're in your prayer closet, be careful not to pray out loud because the devil's listening. But I promise you this, when you grab the horns of the altar and you begin to pray and pour your heart out to God, that sorry devil, he'll put some kind of ungodly thought in your mind. He'll get your mind running so because he's attacking your prayer life. Just keep praying. Just keep praying until God shows up in your prayer life. Mm -mm. The third way you can combat spiritual warfare is with a song. Mm -mm. When you start praising the Lord in song, Oh, the devil hates it. Because he knows the power of a song that glorifies God. He's been in the heavenly host. He knows what that does to the heart of God. And when you who haven't seen God with your natural eye, when you haven't heard God's audible voice, when you just choose to believe God and start praising Him with a song, when you're under attack, God just hovers around you and that spirit of demonic uh, influence will flee. Mm -hmm. Scriptures, supplication, and a song are your weapons against spiritual warfare. Second Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, uh, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Friend, there are things that will haunt you if you choose to let them. You don't have to be haunted. The Bible says, Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can have victory over every thought, every influence, everything in this world, if you'll put your faith in the Lord, and you'll put into plan the Word of God. Why do you think He gave us the book? It's the absolute final authority of our life. This has all the answers to every problem you, you ever face, but it's the sword of the Spirit. This is what will send the enemy running. Learn your Bible. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Memorize your Bible. Just start memorizing some scriptures so that when you feel oppressed or depressed or compressed, you can quote a scripture and see how much relief you'll find from the Savior. Why do you think he gave us a book? Why do you think he gave us the ability to pray? You know, not everybody can sing, not everybody can teach, not everybody, but everybody can pray. Why do you think he gave you a song? He equipped you for those days when you're under attack. And then he gave you a sanctuary where you can come and gather amongst like-minded people and draw strength from them. I wonder tonight, have you been in a battle? I guarantee you.
or you're facing one, or you're getting ready to face one, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Faith comes from the Scriptures. Get you a verse, one that'll help you, and you'll find that with Jesus, you are the victor. All of hell cannot prevail against you, my friend, when the Lord is your might and your strength. Let's all stand. Maybe you need to come and ask God to help you. Maybe you're in a battle. Why don't you come? He'll help you. Maybe you need to come and thank Him. Maybe you need to come and tell Him you love Him. Maybe tonight you got a burden for somebody. You want to pray for them. They're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do thank You that through You we can pull down strongholds. We can overcome. We can have victory tonight over these thoughts and these things that haunt us. Lord, left unchecked, they'll continue to haunt us. But through Christ Jesus and through the power of the Holy Ghost and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can gain the victory tonight. Now, Father, I pray for folks. You'll help them. Lord, they might not have needed this message tonight, but they'll need it sometime. Bring it to their remembrance and help them to gain victory. Lord, there are some in the altar tonight might be dealing with some of these things. Help them, Lord. Undergird them. Strengthen them. Give them the victory. Lord, just speak to hearts now. And God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for what you do. It's in the holy name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen.